This morning we're we're continuing on in a a sermon series called Kingdom Politics, following Jesus in a a partisan world. So if you are new to us this morning, this is your first Sunday, I apologize. Uh, We are talking about politics. Uh, We're told never bring up uh, politics and and religion in family settings. We're doing both uh, this morning. Uh, And if you have, have been new to us or are new to us, I would encourage you to go back and watch the last couple of weeks. Uh, Two weeks ago we began to lay this out as we wrestled with the question of, uh, you know, using Paul's words in Philippians, what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven, but also a citizen of, in particular, this nation? And how do we make sense of that in light of our Christian faith? Uh, Last week, Pastor Todd preached uh, what I believe to be one of the most uh, vulnerable sermons I've ever heard him preach, uh, as he talked about the struggle of, of talking about politics in a faith setting and how divisive some of this has become in our national rhetoric. Uh, And what happens in that is we pit people against each other. Uh, And he used, uh, rightfully so, the example of what's happening uh, just 40 some miles away from here in Springfield, Ohio. And so we as Christians are called to not just think in the black and white or not just think in the realm of Democrat, Republican, but to think through uh, the lens of our faith and particularly the lens of the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be citizens of the kingdom of God? And so today we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, uh, what I think is one of the most misused passages of scripture as we wrestle with uh, governments, and that is Romans 13. Uh, All of us uh, interact with laws and governments. They're they're important to uh, our society as as a people. Uh, I can remember my first interaction very clearly uh, with the law. Uh, I was 16 years old, and uh, I was running late uh, to an appointment, And I was flying through these back country roads, uh, heading towards Lima, Ohio, and uh, all of a sudden, in my rearview mirror, I saw the lights. You know the lights. And I heard the siren to pull me over. Now, I'd like to say that I was heading somewhere really cool, like, you know, I was late for a concert. I was late for trombone lessons. So, (laughs) if that gives you a window of who I was in high school, it's that. Uh, but so here's what happened, though. Uh, I also, this also gives you a window into my teenage years. I was taking an elective in school, family consumer science. Anybody take a family consumer science class? And in that class, we had to take home one of those uh, robotic babies. Y'all, y'all heard of these? It's supposed to deter you, you know, from have, making a baby. And so I have this fake baby in a car seat in the back and it's crying. (laughs) And I don't know what they do today with technology, but but back in the day, you had a key that you had to shove in the back of the baby and hold it until the baby stopped crying. And so what happened was when you returned the baby to the teacher, uh, she was able to, to do some printout of how long your baby was crying to prove that you are a neglectful parent. So this baby is wailing in my back seat, and I am flying down these country roads, and this cop pulls me over. So I roll down my window, and yes, it was one of these, <laughs> roll down the window, and, and the cop sees this car seat, but I have the little awning, I don't know what you call it, kind of covering the baby, and, and he's you know, looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and there's like this unexchanged, like no words are being exchanged, but we're both like, this is really awkward. Like none of us want to be here in this moment. And, and so finally he's engaging me and, and he says, what's, what's going on? Who's in the back seat? And I said, a baby. <laughs> and he says, are you a father? And I said, no, thank you, Jesus. But, but I, so I'm trying to explain to him that I have this robotic baby in my back seat and I have to get out, I have to shut it off with the key. And so luckily he was so gracious and kind and probably just felt horrible for this 16 year old kid. He lets me out of the car, I pull out this baby and he and I are standing on the side of the road while I shove a key in the back of this baby. And luckily all but by his mercy, he let me go. I think it was one of those situations like, you've had enough, like it's just, just, go. 
That was my first interaction with the law as a 16-year-old. But laws matter, don't they? Uh, they're, they're this kind of social contract that, that keeps humanity from running ourselves into the ground. If I had my choice, there wouldn't be speed limits, but luckily there are parameters and boundaries that keep even me in check. Laws keep us safe, they keep society in order, and they establish penalties for those who break them. Or, in this case, I was shown mercy. There's virtually no area in our life that is not affected by the government and by laws. Just think about it. If you buy a home, there's laws that guide that whole process. You buy a car, a can of soda, how you get paid, your health care, how you travel, how fast you can drive, they're all interactions with the government and with laws. So this raises questions for us. Is there a biblical and theological approach that we as people of Christ are to take? How should Christians engage the government, especially when laws or policies or practices go against our Christian belief? And to get at that, I want to look before we get to the Sermon on the Mount, because this whole series is based around the Sermon on the Mount, I want to invite you to turn to Romans chapter 13. It's on page 923 in the Black Pew Bible. Romans 13. Romans 13 has perhaps been the most engaged portion of the Bible when it comes to an engagement with government. This is Paul's words, his instruction to these Roman Christians about how they're to understand the government in which they find themselves living under. So listen to these words. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, For there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval, for it is God's servant for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. Pay to all what is due them, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Keep your Bibles open as we're going to be looking at a couple of passages this morning. So that settles it, right? Governments, including the U.S. government, are to rule and reign divinely. It seems that Paul is advocating for that, that Governmental systems, no matter which government one lives under, is divinely appointed. And this passage of Scripture, as I said, is a passage that that has been looked at by Christians since its writing, trying to understand our relationship to governmental systems. And some have used it to to baptize governments. An example of that would be what what we kind of fled from as a nation, the, the, the divine right and rule of kings and queens to reign supreme. Even today, in our siblings across the pond in the UK believe that their governmental system is predicated upon the fact that the monarch is divinely appointed. So much so that the the English king is not only king of the state, but also called the head of the church, the Church of England. Or there are more recently in our own nation kind of a, a push towards a theocratic form of government called Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism seeks to legislate and implement a version of Christian morality for all people to live under, to be executed by the government. 
It seeks to disintegrate any line between what's classically called the separation of church and state. And this passage, Romans 13, has been used as a justification to say the U.S. is currently or was founded as a, quote, Christian nation. Is Paul baptizing all forms of government as having a divine right to rule and reign? Is he suggesting that that Christians should just roll over and accept whatever government we have? Or to rule over and do whatever our government says? Do you feel some tension? Governments, according to Paul, are a part of God's divine order. Paul does seem to affirm that governments are created by God, but but he does not fully sanction all of their behavior, and we'll see that here in a moment. I think this stems from, for Paul, uh, really hearkening back to the, the very creation story itself. Remember the Genesis narrative we hear as God creates the world. The the story seems to slow down a bit when God is creating humanity. And of all the created beings, of all the things in creation, it is only humanity that we hear God particularly makes human beings in God's own image. And that these human beings are, are given some responsibility to rule and to reign over the earth with God. No other uh, created being in the creation narrative is given that responsibility. It is only given to humans to co-create and to co-manage and co-order the world in the name of God. John Wesley believed this in uh, the founder of our tradition. Wesley understood the image of God kind of reflecting God through kind of three different lenses. He called it the political image of God, the moral image of God, and and the natural image of God. And the political image of God, Wesley understood it as to be made in God's image is to take on God's characteristics, which includes God's ability to order and create to steward and care for this earth. And so humanity is given that responsibility. We are to lead. We're to manage. We're to order this world for God's continued purposes. It's really an invitation for us to steward that power and responsibility. So we hear language in the creation story to subdue the earth, to have dominion over the earth, to bless the earth, and to multiply. Those are all words of stewardship. So then by extension, governmental systems which are made up of, made up of, and organized by humans, made in God's image, are one of the means by which God continues to order this world. We are a part of that. We get to participate in the ordering of societies. But while Governmental systems have been created to institute justice and do good. That's what Paul is saying in this passage, to bring order out of disorder. It's not to say they always do. Certainly the the American governmental experience is a mixed bag at best. There have been times where in our own nation our government has done tremendous good. And continues to do tremendous good all over the world. But we also have not only the capacity, but we have the history that says we have also done horrendous evil. The divine ordering of governments managed by image bearers, co-creators with God, is also full of of corrupted, sinful people. And we see this throughout the Bible. I mean, you could spend five minutes in the Old Testament, and you can see that while the kings are to rule and reign and manage God's creation, they seek to accumulate power and do ruthless and horrendous things. Paul, while while saying governmental systems are meant to bring justice, also says 
In Romans 3, you know what? At the end of the day, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Or earlier in chapter 3, he says this, there's no one in all the earth who seeks God. There is no one, not even one, who is righteous. So even though Paul recognizes the capacity for humans to do evil and wrong, Paul seems to make space for governments to exist, to work for the common good of their citizens through the creation and execution of its laws. Not perfectly, but that's their purpose. But here's what's interesting. Paul, who seems to affirm that governments are a part of God's good order of the world, is a walking contradiction in and of himself. Paul, who seems to say governments have a place to execute justice, to execute laws, to order society, he contradicts that through his own lived experience. Paul breaks the law. He is arrested at least three times that we have recorded in Scripture. Clement of Rome, one of the earliest church fathers, one of the first bishops of Rome, he says in his writings, Paul was arrested over seven times. Paul was arrested for disobeying the laws by preaching the gospel. And not only that, it's not only bad enough that he breaks the law, in Acts chapter 16, he escapes prison. <laughs> And he, and he gets the, the, the guard in prison to go along with him. And if Paul wasn't in prison, he was under house arrest. And most likely, according to church history, Paul was killed in Rome by the very government that he seems to say is divinely appointed. Notice w what he said in verse 4. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. Paul contradicts himself a bit. So while Paul believes that the government is a part of God's good order, and that governments should establish laws to order society, Paul was motivated by a far superior law. And that is the law of divine love. And when, it's, when, we, when we see that, then Paul's words begin to make a little bit more sense in Romans 13. So let's look at how Paul actually makes this argument in Romans 13. And to get at that, we have to see what he says before it and what he says after it. Look at verse 9 of chapter 12. Most likely, little caveat, little commercial, when Scripture is written, it doesn't have these nice subheadings that we have. Notice, like, my Bible says in, in uh, chapter 13, be subject to authorities, as if that is a separate argument from what Paul has said before. That Paul is writing a letter. Most of us don't put headers in our letters. We just make one long argument. So what, what Paul says before this, starting in verse 9, is tied to what he says in, in chapter 13, which is tied to what he's going to say at the end of chapter 13. So listen to what he says. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to the English ver NRSV says strangers, it most likely better translation is foreigners. Extend hospitality to foreigners. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And hear this, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, 
feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not, overco- do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. It's one continuous argument. And now listen to what he says in verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. This is one argument Paul is making about how these early Christians are to embody the law of love in real life. It's a strategy Paul is laying out on on how to live the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. To bless those who persecute, to empathize with those who are weak, to pursue the plans of peace, to love one's neighbor. And so Romans 13 cannot be plucked out as something separate from what is said before and after. This section is what living the Sermon on the Mount looks like in real time. Or Scott McKnight says it this way. He says Romans 13 then is not a a theoretical discussion of church and state, but a pastoral aside in an exhortation of learning how to love when the odds are stacked against you. And when we think about who Paul is writing to, it begins to make even more sense. Paul is writing to a minority group of Christians in Rome who had zero political power and influence They are in the epicenter of Rome's power. And Paul's instructing these Christians to live at peace with Rome as much as it depends upon you. Live at peace with all. Do not retaliate. Do not rise up against Rome. Many scholars believe this is why Paul brings up taxes. Because what was happening in this time in history is that there was a high tax on imports from outside of Rome. And so what happened was the people who took the brunt of those imports, the high taxes on them, were the poorest of the poor. And most likely these minority Christians. And they were struggling to just get basic needs fulfilled. And there were rumblings going on in Rome about some sort of organized retaliation against the government. And so Paul calls this minority church to practice an ethic of love instead. To practice an ethic of love even in their engagement to their government. And I think Paul can say this because he believes ultimately in a higher and greater kingdom. That in the end, Rome itself, with its power and military might and social influence, is inferior to the true kingdom and the true king. And so he says, go ahead, pay your taxes, as it will contribute ultimately to your neighbor's common good, and it will keep peace with Rome. But most importantly, he says, love. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Do good, be hospitable, practice peace. But when we see Paul's own life and choices, when when the kingdom of God that he follows clashes with the kingdom of Rome, Paul will always err on the side of the greater law, the law of love. And it's this law of love that's rooted in and born out of and grows from the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the invitation for followers of Jesus to put into practice what it means to live no matter what time of history we find ourselves, no matter what government system we're under, no matter the political climate, to practice and live the law of love. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5. Turn to Matthew 5, verse 38. 
Paul might be hearkening to Jesus' own teachings in Romans 12 and 13 when, he, when we hear Jesus say in verse 38, You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, Jesus says, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, go ahead and give him your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to walk one mile, which was probably a reference to Roman soldiers who could literally look at you and say, carry my book bag, my backpack, and, and, and I'm too tired, you have to carry it. Jesus says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, you know what? Go the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven for he makes his sun rise on the evil, but there's an evil governmental system, and on the good. And sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is inviting his followers to live no matter what governmental system they're under to practice the law of love. If you walk away with anything in this sermon series or anything I say today, I hope it's this, and we still have a couple of weeks. In the language of political ideologies, the primary ideology of a Christian is love. Let me say that again. In the language of political ideologies, and we all have them. We all have ideologies. But our primary ideology of a Christian is the law of love. Love is the greatest law, the greatest commandment, the greatest ethic, and a Christian's fundamental motivation and interaction with everyone around them. Everything, including our political affiliations and support, gets filtered through the lens of love. Now, as I close, that we need to note that there are some similarities to Paul's world and not some similarities to Paul's world and ours. We should pay our taxes as they contribute to the common good. And taxes provide benefit to society like access to health care, roads, or social services, or safety and protection, or access to education. That leads to human flourishing. Paying taxes is a recognition that I may benefit, but I also may not. It may be for somebody else's good. An example of that is Medicare. I'm not old enough for Medicare, but I'm paying into it. Just I know some of you are as well. I don't directly benefit from it at this stage of my life, but my kids' grandparents do. Some of you do. Taxes are important, and a tax system that's fair and does not place a higher burden on the poor is an act of justice. So Paul says, pay your taxes. Not that we have any choice, really, but. (laughs) And I know we're all masters at, I do it too. I play the tax game like everybody else. But Paul's saying this is how we live at peace with our governmental systems. But there is a difference between Paul's world and ours. Paul didn't live in a democracy. Christians at this time had no, zero say in governmental affairs. So as a right and a privilege of voting, you and I have the unique, and and, and when I say unique, it's not the same all over the world, and you know that. We have a unique ability to direct how our government organizes itself and implements its laws. It's very different than Paul's own world. And so when our primary ideology and motivation is love, not love of self, not the preservation of my own wants and desires, or my need to be in power and control, or people who look like me, but the love of neighbor, the love of enemy, 
we then will direct our government through our voice and vote to fulfill its divine mandate to care for the needs of all people, to execute justice equally, and to do good. So political parties are important, policies are important, candidates are important, but only as much as they aid in our collective ability to love and care for all people. I want to say this one last time. As we are approaching an election, and next week we're going to talk about when the Christian goes to the poll, what's our faith say about that process? I want to reiterate, in the language of political ideologies, the primary ideology for a Christian is love. I want to close with a, with a prayer that comes from the Book of Common Prayer, which is a book that Anglicans pray. Uh, it's their prayer book throughout the world. And there's this great prayer in it called A Litany for Sound Government. So I want to invite you to pray with me as we pray for our government to be ordered in a way, in such a manner, that leads to human flourishing for all people. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, our governor, bless the leaders of our land that we may be a people of peace among ourselves and blessing to other nations of the earth. Lord, keep this nation under your care. To the president and members of the cabinet, to governors of states, mayors of cities, and to all in administrative authority, grant wisdom and grace in the exercise of their duties. Give grace to your servants, O Lord. To senators and representatives and those who make our laws in states, cities, and towns, give courage, wisdom, and foresight to provide for the needs of all our people and to fulfill our obligation in the community of nations. Give grace to your servants, O Lord. To the judges and officers of our courts, give understanding and integrity that human rights may be safeguarded and justice served. Give grace to your servants, O Lord. And finally, teach our people to rely on your strength and to accept their responsibilities to their fellow citizens, that they may elect trustworthy leaders and make wise decisions for the well-being of our society, that we may serve you faithfully in our generation and honor your holy name. For yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Amen.